We've heard about the stories about traditional Aboriginal practices that trump conventional medicine or even changes to Canadian laws. And while many would argue these changes are long overdue to correct past injustices in Canada, our guest tonight says it may actually be limiting progress. Joining us now for more in our nation's capital is Jeffrey Simpson, National Affairs columnist with The Globe and Mail. Jeffrey, hello. Hello, how are you? I'm okay. Um, I want to... Um, start our conversation as a jumping off point uh, to read just a bit of what you wrote inside Policy Magazine, McDonnell Laurie Institute. Here's what you wrote. We non-Aboriginals tried subjugation and assimilation and it failed. We are now trying or at least accepting parallelism, even what I might call a radical parallelism. After almost half a century of trying this recreation of a long ago past and modern idiom, the least we can say is that progress has been and remains heartbreakingly slow. So let's start off with the term that you say, you call it a radical parallelism. What is that? It's an attempt to uh, create a situation in which uh, Aboriginals are self-governing nations, in which they have wide sway over their own affairs on territories that they control. And they may or may not be consistent with the crown and the law of the country. Um, that has been endorsed by the Supreme Court of Canada that has been um, argued for forcefully by major Aboriginal leaders. That has been uh, more recently advanced by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, if you go back historically in the la early Trudeau years, the first Trudeau, uh, he presented a white paper that basically said, get rid of the Indian Act, get rid of special arrangements for Aboriginals. This was in keeping with his own view of how society should be organized. There was a furious reaction against that by Aboriginal leaders and Trudeau dropped it. And ever since then, as I say, we've been concentrating on basically what we don't have in common rather than what we do have in common. And uh, it hasn't produced the results that either side want. Mm. You also raised, because you raised the, the Trudeau white paper in this article, you also raised um, the Royal Commission under um, Brian Mulroney, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Affairs. And you preferred both of them um, as seminal. How do you, why do you see those two as particularly seminal? Well, we're talking, well, first of all, the white paper that you referred to of Mr. Trudeau was seminal in the sense that it was an attempt by the government of Canada to completely redial the whole issue and basically say that the special standing of Aboriginal people in the country should no longer exist, that they should be citizens like everybody else. And that was completely rejected by the Aboriginal leadership who saw themselves as being um, the first uh, inhabitants of this land and therefore accruing to them were rights that the Crown had given them in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, etc. Then came the Royal Commission and it was a five volume effort and uh, I, I, I brag a bit and say I read it all. And I actually <laughs> wrote a book chapter about George Erasmus who was the co-chairman of the Commission and really the driving force of the Commission and that commission adopted the parallelism approach that I've just described, up to and including an extremely convoluted attempt by a former Supreme Court uh, Justice Bertha Wilson to create an Aboriginal Parliament that would somehow be tied to but separate from the Parliament of Canada, uh, economies that would be based on a kind of um, 1960s uh, social development model that failed almost everywhere in the world and a reading of history whereby before we settlers arrived, in quotes, uh, Aboriginals uh, had been self-governing, self-sufficient, and peaceful peoples, a very, a very potted history. So um, the parallelism that the Royal Commission advanced uh, furthered and deepened the assumptions that had been, um, shall we say, increasingly entrenched in thinking about Aboriginal affairs after the uh, wiping away of the white paper by Mr. Trudeau. Okay. Uh, and, and the Royal Commission actually didn't have much impact despite its length and budget, largely because many of its recommendations were not realistic. Mm. It did have a long section, by the way, about uh, the residential schools, which uh, it properly denounced and exposed and uh, led to a subsequent apology by the Krechen government for those schools. Uh, much soul-searching in the churches and the raising of money to give to those who had suffered from the schools. And that, in turn, led to a second apology in the House of Commons by the Harper government, 
and that in turn led to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission chaired by Mr. Justice Sinclair of Manitoba. So we've been around this issue of the residential schools now in commission form, in apology form, and in restitution form for, I guess, about 30 years. I want to um, step back to something that you, j you said just a little bit ago. And in framing your, your article and your argument, um, you challenge, as, as Jeffrey Simpson is, is wont to do, some of the typically held narratives um, that we have societal. And one of them is something that you just said. Um, and it goes back to pre-contact with Europeans, with settlers. And that assumption that everything was fine between various Aboriginal First Nations groups. You say it wasn't, that there was lots going on. So tell us about that. Well, look, one has to be very careful here because we non-Aboriginals, we of European descent, come from a civilization within which there have been the most grievous wars that one could possibly imagine as between nations and as, a, as between religions. So I'm not pointing any fingers here and saying that we're somehow superior to anybody else. You just look at the history of Western Christendom and you, you, you see that we have much to, much to atone for. But when the uh, so-called settlers arrived, they were greatly assisted, of course, by the aboriginals. This applies in the United States, too. Many of them would never have survived if it hadn't been for aboriginal assistance in the early years. But when they arrived with their guns and their technology, uh, aboriginals uh, frequently had been in conflict with each other and signed up the settlers, the French and the English in our case, to be part of the older struggles that they had been fighting in my part of the world, in our part of the world in Ontario, the animosity between Algonquins and Iroquois had been going on for a very long period of time. At one point the Mohawks um, you know, were fighting the Susquehannas, the Delawares, the Illinois, vast territories that they were in conflict with. Um, and so if you read as, as I have uh, as part of book juries and for my own interest the history of Aboriginal peoples before uh, the so-called settlers arrived, it wasn't really altogether bucolic. There certainly were exchanges of commerce. There were peaceful relations among some groups and there was endemic conflict among others. So it's a much more mixed picture than the Aboriginal, uh, than the Royal Commission presented and that is often presented in the narrative to which you just described. But I repeat, in saying this, I'm not lording it over anybody mm -hmm. because, you know, in our part of the world, in this part of the world where I live, in in Ottawa, the St. Lawrence River Valley, the Champlain River Valley was the subject for the better part of a century of conflict between the British and the French, between the Americans and the French, and so we, we, it was not a peaceful place uh, for non-Aboriginals for a long period of time. Mercifully, it has been since the War of 1812-14. But you make the point, the historical point, that challenges our narrative to make the argument for how it plays into modern relations, 2015 relationships between the federal government, non-Aboriginal Canadians and Aboriginal Canadians. What do we need to understand about the history that you just laid out that gets us to today to understand the quagmire, if I can put it that way, that we're in right now? Well, I think it's very important to try to have as clear-headed a view of history as possible. And there's certainly a lot of guilt for non-Aboriginals for the way in which they treated Aboriginals. That's all been well documented most recently in terms of residential schools. But it's an uncertain guide as to how to go forward because if you go back, let's say, 300 years to the state of play in North America, the Aboriginal population was much greater than it is today relative to the total population. So today we're dealing with a situation in which in Canada about 4% of the population is Aboriginal. That would involve the First Nations, that would involve the Inuit, and that would involve Métis. Uh, m about half of these live on reservations or reserves, and about half of the Aboriginal populations have fewer than a thousand people. And the question that I don't think, in, in my judgment, or as they say in the courts, my respectful submission, we've adequately addressed, and the Aboriginal leadership hasn't adequately addressed, is the practical fundamental question of how one creates a self-governing nation with groups that number fewer than a thousand people and in a number of cases fewer than 500. And even those numbers are misleading because you take the children out, you take the old folks out, you take the people who've left the reserves to go to the cities or elsewhere, you're dealing with very small numbers, often in isolated places. Now 
I say a bit provocatively in that uh, article, which was based on a lecture I gave at McGill, that if you put 500 PhDs on an isolated area, uh, they probably couldn't make a go of it in terms of creating more than assistance economy. The one thing I know that the 500 PhDs couldn't do is learn how to govern themselves properly. That's a big joke. I'm sorry. Aside, so, so we, 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 are, we, are, we have been going down a path for a long period of time of creating sort of self-governing quote-unquote nations with numbers and capacity that is extremely limited. And this would be true, as I say, even if it was non-aboriginals. But, but Jeffrey, so but Jeffrey yet, let me ask you this. Yes. To, you say that nations and self-governance government should be looked, with, looked at through the prism of numbers. What about things like self-determination and identifying as a nation? Are, aren't those equally important? Well, we can identify within countries, nations. I mean, within Canada, we acknowledge that French-speaking Canadians in Quebec form a nation within a united Canada. But then the question is, can French Canadians deliver on what you expect of a self-governing body? And what do we expect of self-government? What does self-government mean? It means, first of all, that the people are chosen to uh, run the entity on the basis of a democratic system and that they should be able to deliver that which the population in a modern society has a reasonable expectation of receiving. And that would include a health system, an education system, a welfare system, a justice system, a transportation system, etc. And I'm simply saying that when the numbers are very small, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, there's a serious capacity question about whether these can be built. The second question is you have to have enough resources so that from your own work, your own society, to make self-government realistic. Otherwise, you're dependent on somebody else, in which case you're not governing yourself because somebody else is giving you the money. So can we create a wage economy more than a subsistence economy on these reserves with these um, populations such as they are. Now, some reserves are fortunate. They're adjacent to cities. People can work in the cities and go back and forth. I'll give you two simple examples. In Cape Breton, there's a reserve close to Sydney. The economic conditions there are pretty good. There's one that's much further away from Sydney, and I recently spoke to a man who's in the pediatric world at the major Sydney hospital who says that a third of the children from that reserve born in the Sydney hospital have drugs in their system when they're born because of the mother's situation. A very much different unfortunate situation for that reserve. I have a place north of Ottawa. There are two Algonquin bands. One is near the town of Manawaki. It's well governed. The one is much further north, more isolated. It's third world all the way. I've been through the reserve. First of all, very difficult to generalize about Aboriginal peoples. And secondly, if you don't have the capacity to create own source wealth, then you're in a situation of great dependency. And for Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals, when you're in a situation of great dependency, a lot of social pathologies develop. And yet, um, as we see, there are, there are continuing calls for self-governance. Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people alike are saying that is the only way um, to move this country as a whole forward, the various nations as well. How on board tw in 2015 would you say the Harper government is with um, the term that you use, which is parallelism? Well, I don't think they're, I don't, I don't think they're trying to uh, upset that or object to it. I think they're, I think they're, I think they're, there's three things I think that drive the Harper government on this. One is a disappointment that I think the Prime Minister himself feels because there was a lot of pressure from the Aboriginal community to increase the funding and to change the arrangements for federal funding for reserve education. And um, the first effort by the federal government was deemed to be considerably inadequate. So he rolled up his sleeves and sat down with Sean Atlio, who was then the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. And Mr. Harper changed quite a bit of the previous federal government's efforts. Now, it wasn't a whole loaf, but it was certainly better than the first. And Mr. Atlio agreed to it. And I was citing in there a study of these negotiations by Michael Mendelssohn from the Mowat Center in Toronto, I'm, or Caledon Institute, I'm not sure which, I've forgotten, doesn't matter. Well-known scholar, no friend of the Harper government, in which he said, look, this was a fair deal. 
but it got sabotaged by the more radical maximalists in the Aboriginal community, and Mr. Atlio was overthrown as head of the First Nations. So I think Mr. Harper feels sort of disappointed by that and stung by it. Secondly, and this isn't a popular thing to say, but there's a lot of polling data behind this, what I'm about to say. Uh, the patience of non-Aboriginal Canadians as a whole with the Aboriginal file is pretty limited, much more limited than you would suspect listening to elite groups. And Mr. Harper has his ear to the ground on this. There aren't very many votes to be won and it's not just in the conservative world on doing a lot for Aboriginals. I very much regret saying that, but if you read the emails that I get and you have a sense talking to people of where public opinion is at, there's a tolerance limit, and I think Mr. Harper feels it. So I said three reasons. I think those are the, those are the two. Hmm. And at the same time, um, and I hinted or said this so much in the introduction, we have seen courts um, our legal system come in and uh, make rulings um, about our relationship with our um, with Aboriginal people here in Canada. Um, to, to what extent are the courts um, ruling in favor or setting the groundwork for more parallelism, Jeffrey? Well, they have been, in my judgment, uh, especially the Supreme Court of Canada, far more consequential in shaping relations between Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals than governments have been. There have been various efforts and goodwill by governments in this country to try to establish a new relationship. And some time ago I wrote a column in which I went through three of these. One was the Charlottetown Accord, one was an effort by Premier Gordon Campbell in British Columbia, and the third was Mr. Harper's. And in every case, the Aboriginal groups and people, when the, group, when the leaders took it to the people, turned them down. So the, the narrative that says the governments have been insensitive, they've never tried anything, all they want to do is oppress the Aboriginals, is false on its face over the last 30 years. You can argue the, the efforts haven't been enough, but that there, ha there have been serious efforts. Um, the courts took the constitution that was created by Mr. Trudeau and the premiers back in the early 1980s, which said that the treaty, established treaty rights of Aboriginals should be respected and have read into that, as time goes on, more and more rights, up to the recent Chilcotin decision, or Williams if you like, which essentially said that if an Aboriginal group can establish title, i.e. it's occupied the land since time immemorial, to the exclusion of other groups, it should have ownership and title to the land. And that the Crown's interest really is extremely limited in those areas. De jure, the court ruled, these are my words, not the courts, that uh, this, this land belongs to Aboriginal people and they have de jure veto over anything that infringes on that title. If that were to continue, and I'm sure it will be throughout British Columbia where there are no treaties to speak of, you're going to have over the next decades a number of these areas where title has been established. The problem in BC, of course, is that the claims that Aboriginal people have made frequently overlap with each other, so it's very difficult to establish who actually has title. But the court went further and said, even if an Aboriginal group has made a claim to an area, it hasn't been established, but at a claim, then the degree of consultation that's required with that group, in my opinion, de facto gives them a veto as well. So the courts have been extraordinarily influential in, in moving the goalposts, if you say, down the field towards the notion of self-governing nations with title, with ownership, and with de jure or de facto veto over how the land should be used. That wasn't done through negotiations with the government. That was done by the courts and principally the Supreme Court of Canada. And here we are, Jeffrey, in the summer of 2015. And, um to your first point uh, uh, about the Prime Minister or governments making uh, efforts over the years, many would say after the TRCs, the Truth and Reconcilia Reconciliation Commission's final report, the government basically nodded to it and said, yeah, we're not going to do much. Um, as we move forward, and we have a new chief uh, of the AFN, Perry Bellegarde, uh, and there is an appetite, arguably you might say, but I would say there's an appetite in Canada to use this as a tipping point, the TRC final recommendations. How do we move forward? Are we going to move forward along these structures of parallelism? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's right with respect. I think that there's a great reserve in the country about this. I agree that those who've spoken publicly have endorsed 
the recommendations and the thinking behind it, but I think there's a great deal of quiet reserve about this. Um, I think, for example, if you got a report on your desk that had 94 recommendations and was 388 pages long, the easy thing to do, which is what the NDP leader did, was to say, if I get elected, we're going to do all 94 of them. He barely read the damn thing. Um, I'm not defending the prime minister, but when you're the prime minister, you have an obligation to at least give some consideration to matters before you speak. Now, we'll see over time how many of these recommendations actually see the light of day. Um, and I, w I explained before why I think there's greater reticence on the part of the conservative prime minister than perhaps the other leaders. But we shall see if Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Mulcair get elected, how they would conduct themselves on this file. Okay. We shall see. Fair, fair point. But let's talk about, I know you've read the TRC, the, the, the report. We're not going to go through all 94 recommendations. But in your view of how to move our relations forward, what do you see as positive in terms of the recommendations coming out of the TRC that can change our relationship and get us all moving forward? I, I have a, a, a different take. Uh, I think, and I think I'm in a small group when I say this, that what we should be, have been trying to do and what we should try to do in the future is figure out how we can determine what we have in common rather than what we have done to each other in the past and how we can separate ourselves further. What can we do together? And interestingly enough, Murray Sinclair, who was the chairman of that uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, who's a very admirable man. I know many people in Manitoba who think very highly of Murray Sinclair, uh, is actually kind of epitomizes what I'm talking about because here's somebody who has a very strong sense of himself as an Aboriginal and who has brought that sensitivity to what I would call mainstream society as a lawyer and as a judge. He hasn't separated himself from the rest of society. He has actually been part of ab uh, what I call mainstream or non-Aboriginal society, bringing an Aboriginal sensitivity and background to bear on the way we deal with certain problems. I'm always impressed when I look at the Aboriginal Cultural Achievement Awards, which are sometimes on television, about how these tremendously gifted Aboriginal artists in all domains have brought their Aboriginal sensitivities to bear upon, shall we say, mainstream cultural uh, consumers. Same thing with Aboriginal business awards. They're frequently given to Aboriginal businesses that are doing business in mainstream society. This, I think, is the direction that we need to think through rather than the path that we've been on, which is to say, how can we create more separation, more independent self-government, as it were? So how do we marry the sensitivity and the perspectives of Aboriginals with the broader Canadian society when Aboriginals do represent, as I said, only about 4% of the Canadian population? That, I think, would be fruitful. That, I think, would find a great deal of favor with non-Aboriginals. That, I think, is the direction that some of what I consider to be the more progressive Aboriginal leaders want to go, like Joe Louis, uh, Chief Joe Louis in the southern, Clarence Louis, rather, in the southern part of British Columbia. And there are other young Aboriginal leaders who look at the awful conditions of their people and say this is the way forward. We need jobs and we need training and we need education and we need and we can't get all that if we isolate ourselves and we separate ourselves. So I have a kind of different take on all of this and as you say I'm in a respectful disagreement with the narrative that has been advanced. And I say one other thing on this which is we have to be very careful with w the words that we use here. And the phrase cultural genocide, which the Chief Justice of Canada chose to use in a lecture that she gave, is an extremely explosive word. The word genocide itself is probably the most explosive word in politics and in international relations and international history. It's been used extensively even in the modern iteration by Armenians and by people involved in the Rwandan genocide, etc. And cultural genocide is a bit of a slide and when you, in the same lecture, refer to the Holocaust, where 8 million people, Jews and others, died in a deliberate way, and other kinds of genocides where governments have systematically gone out and slaughtered tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of people, and then you throw in cultural genocide, I think you're asking for 
an explosive response, a slippery response, and one that isn't really very helpful in trying us to move forward as opposed to looking backwards. And uh, we have done programs, and, and many people, again, um, disagree with you on, on the use of the term cultural genocide and within this context. They say, it's no absolute, they say it's absolutely appropriate, but always good to get provocative Jeffrey Simpson on. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey, for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pia. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.